Welcome to our second part of the introductory session to requirements engineering. After the motivation of why requirements engineering is relevant, let's now have a look at the relevant and important aspects of requirements engineering. So pretty much an overview. And let's start with some definitions so that we're all speaking the same language and that we all have a common understanding of what relevant terms we have to use. Let's first start with software. We're computer scientists, so the main purpose or often the purpose of requirements engineering is to elicit and get requirements for a software product that is supposed to be developed. So let's get a, one of many, many, many definitions for software. Uh, for the purpose of this course, we're gonna go with the following. Software is a collection of computer programs, procedures, directives, associated documentation and data. Nothing special there, just one of definition that makes sense in the context of what we're gonna discuss. More interestingly, now for the sake of this course is to also have a definition of what is a requirement. And very similar to the definition of software, there are many, um, most of them have a rather big overlap. Some of them are quite special. For the sake of this course, we would go with the IEEE definition as outlined in the standard that we referenced here below. And they define requirements as follows. First, a condition or capability needed by a user to solve a problem or achieve an objective. So what do I want or what does a user want or need? A condition or capability that must be met or possessed by a system or system component to satisfy a contract, standard, specification or other formally imposed documents. And third, a documented representation of a condition or capability. Third part, very important, is not just like getting those, but also making sure that they have been properly documented. And with those three major parts of the definition, we'll walk through the rest of the lecture series. What's missing is now the definition of requirements engineering. And here we also have various definitions, but for the sake of this course, we're now gonna go with the one from the lecture book that we referenced and provided to you in the literature references, which defines requirements engineering as a systematic disciplined approach to the specification and management of requirements with the following goals. First, knowing the relevant requirements, achieving a consensus among the stakeholders about the requirements, documenting them according to given standards and managing them systematically. So that's point number one. Second, understanding and documenting the stakeholders' desires and needs, specifying and managing requirements to minimize the risks of delivering a system that does not meet the stakeholders' desires and needs. Quite wordy, for the sake of all our examinations, I do not want you, I do not ask you to replicate those word by word. We want you to understand what requirements are. We want you to understand what requirements engineering is. So if you are able to put this in your own words while capturing the important properties, totally fine with us. Now that we know what software is, what requirements are and what requirements engineering is from a definition perspective, let's know look at the core activities of requirements engineering. There are four. First, elicitation, which means obtaining requirements from stakeholders and other sources and refining those requirements. So essentially, what do people want? You have to figure it out. And second, once you figured out what they want, you document them. If you go back to the definition of a requirement, there was a very important aspect about also documenting requirements. So this is gonna be a part, a big, big part of the whole lecture, how to properly document requirements. It's about the adequate description of elicited requirements. And we'll talk about different techniques of documentation, natural language, conceptual models, and many more. Third, validation and negotiation is concerned with validation of documented requirements and possibly their negotiations in case there are some inconsistencies or contradicting requirements from different stakeholders. And that validation and negotiation phase should happen as early as possible so that we can resolve those potential conflicts or inconsistencies as early as possible. And fourth, managing the requirements that you have elicited and documented. That's orthogonal to the other activities and not just something that happens at the end. This is something that happens continuously. 
And it consists of measures for structuring the requirements, especially for large and complex projects, maintaining consistencies after changing, preparing the requirements for use in different roles, and also ensuring that the requirements have not only been elicited and documented, but also subsequently implemented as part of the project. If we now move further in those different tools and pieces and building blocks that we need for requirements engineering, we also have to think about requirement types. So we defined what a requirement is, but there are different types of requirement that make the understanding easier. So there are a few examples that we listed here using the very simple use case of a calculator. Um, calculator should be able to perform basic arithmetic operations. Um, so example, which operation should be supported is a question that needs to be answered and a requirement is derived from that. Could be a super simple calculator where you can just add, subtract and multiply. Maybe division is also interesting, but maybe you don't need modular operations. So that, like what kind of functionalities should be provided is a requirement. How fast should the calculations be? Is it sufficient if you get a result within five seconds maximum or does it have to be super fast within 10 milliseconds because it's going to be a calculator that is somehow part of high-speed trading system at Wall Street? And also what kind of numbers should be supported? If it's a calculator for elementary school, you're probably fine with integers and floats. You don't need to come up with any complex numbers there. But let's say you have to also provide Multiplication for hexadecimal values, you might have to think about something else. So you get the idea. So um, there are different requirements and the purpose of those examples now is to also let you like lead you towards what type of requirements do they belong to those examples. Usually you split requirements into three major types. First, so-called functional requirements. Second, quality requirements. And then third, constraints. Functional requirements are often documented using three perspectives, data perspective, functional perspective, and behavioral perspective. Don't worry if this seems to be quite random and not really intuitive for now. We'll go into detail in the next slide, but also it will become more intuitive throughout the lecture, especially when we're talking about the elicitation and documentation phase. So let's first talk a little bit about functional requirements. Functional requirement is a requirement concerning the result of behavior that shall be provided by a function of the system. So in simple terms, what is it supposed to do? What functionalities do you want to have from this? So there are these three perspectives that we'll discuss later in detail. And an example going back to our calculator for functional requirement would be the calculator must be able to read numbers as input. This is something that the calculator application is supposed to do. Second example that it has to do is the calculator must be able to add two numbers and display the result. Also something that it does, has to do, it's a functionality that it has to provide. So besides functional requirements, we also have so-called quality requirements. A quality requirement is a requirement that pertains to a quality concern that is not covered by functional requirements. And a rule of thumb to differentiate between Functional and non-functional or quality requirements is often um, that functional things can be expressed in a verb, while non-functional or quality requirements are often described or can be described using adverbs. So add to numbers verb, um, add them as seen here in the example, um, to, together within like 10 milliseconds giving the result back. So how fast should it be then being a non-functional requirement? Another example could be an average, the calculator must not crash more often than every 10,000 operations. So also giving you quality requirement of how good it's supposed to be. Typically, those quality requirements are about performance as stated in the two examples that we just discussed, uh, or the one example, availability, dependability, scalability, portability uh, of a system, uh, but there are more aspects that are relevant to this. You can further categorize quality requirements and there are standards and ISOs who do so. We'll look into them a little bit later. Quality of system functions include also appropriateness or security and safety, which 
could become relevant in contexts like self-driving cars or autonomous systems, but also accurateness of calculations. If we go back to our calculator, are two decimal values okay, or do I need 20, 30, 40 decimal values to make sense of my calculations? Interoperability could also be relevant or conforming to standards. And we also have dependability of functionalities like robustness, fault tolerance, recoverability. What happens if the software that controls the brakes of an autonomous car crashes? Would be nice if we can get back into some kind of fault tolerance safety mode or at least recover from system failure um, to prevent any crashes. Usability of systems goes in that direction as well. System efficiency also, but we'll cover those aspects a little bit later in more detail. Then finally, we also have changeability of a system, like how analyze, can you analyze it, how stable is it, can you test it, and also the portability of your system. How easy is it to install, how easy is it to replace, how easy is it to adapt it. And finally, quality requirements are often related to multiple functional requirements and they should not be mixed. And of course, also the relationship should be well documented. So for example, what should provide outputs within 10 milliseconds needs proper relationship to the, to the operations of extraction, subtraction, um, addition, multiplication, division, modular operations, and so on and so on. Finally, third category, constraints. Constraints are probably among the easiest because it's just like, okay, where are your borders or where, what, what limits what you can do and also what you should do and what you should think about. So constraint is a requirement that limits the solution space beyond what is necessary for meeting the given functional requirements and quality requirements. So it's really nice to push stuff out um, that just makes your life more difficult. But on the other hand, of course, the stakeholders, your customers are giving you the constraints, so it could still be unrealistic and quite painful. They cannot be influenced by the development team and constraints are not implemented. They are adhered to. This is not something that you have to build or implement. You just have to make sure that you adhere to them. The constraint is not part of the solution. It simply limits how the solution will look like. So it can be nice and helpful for you because it limits your space, but it can also be a hassle because it makes your life more complicated. What could be an example of a constraint in the context of our calculator example? The calculator shall be implemented on hardware that allows double precision floating point operations. Gives you a basic idea of what the hardware uh, underlying your software should look like. Or the calculator should be available on the market in June 2023. That has been two months ago while recording this, so we're already late. Um, but those constraints could also be imposed by budgets, not just time budgets as here in this example, but also financial budgets or just person month. How much work power do you have? How much work power do you get to develop the project? Or legal constraints. Um, so there are like a lot of those and yeah. Next. Very important definition. We slightly touched this in the previous video, uh, what a stakeholder is. And once again, there are many, many, many definitions. Some listed here. Uh, once again, it's not about learning them by heart. It's about understanding them and being able to replicate and understand the major properties of those definitions. So according to this one provided in our reference book, a stakeholder is either a person or an organization that has the potential interest in the system to be developed. A, sta ta whoop, a stakeholder typically has their own requirements for a system. A person can represent the interest of different stakeholders, people and or organization. For example, a stakeholder can have more than one role and represent more than one stakeholder. So I can be the marketing person selling the product that you're supposed to build, but I can also at the same time be a user of the same thing that I'm selling. So I can have different roles there. Examples of stakeholders, customers, very intuitive system and software developers. So the developers also are stakeholders, system users, the architects, the domain experts. For example, you're building maybe an application for the healthcare sector. So you also need like domain expert from that field, testers, maintenance staff, many, many more. <laughs>